afternoon. I got up this morning and I didn't even know if I'd be able to talk tonight. I've been battling a sinus infection and I've been preaching my tonsils to the back of the tent. Amen. But I'm glad that God has strengthened me today. Say amen. amen. And I'm going to get rid of my McDonald's headset. And I'm going to the handheld like I used to preach with. Jimmy Swagger. Yeah, I had to get the Jimmy Swagger man yeah. and get the take off. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to take your Bible, turn to Mark chapter number 10 tonight. I believe the Lord has a message for us. I am uh, also well aware that many of you have to get up and work tomorrow. I know that Brother James Crowell has got to drive an hour and a half back home. So I respect that tonight. But thank you for for uh, coming and being with us in the tent tonight. Yeah. I want you to look with me. At, uh, God spoke to me clearly. I mean, I didn't have a clue what I was going to preach tonight. This afternoon, it was just like out of nowhere. <laughs> I was getting out of the shower and the Holy Ghost said, preach on this subject. Help me. I'm falling and I can't get up. Yeah. There's somebody in here, you just like that commercial. Yeah. Well, that lady's on the floor. And she's hitting the life alert button and she's hollering, Help me! I'm falling! And I can't get up! <laughs> and a voice comes over the transponder and says, We're sending help right away. Yeah. I want you to know tonight there's some guys here that have been struggling with addictions. Yeah. There's people here tonight that have been struggling with problems in their own life. You're not in a program, but you need a program tonight. And I want you to know tonight that the Lord knows if you have fallen, you can get back up. You don't have to stay there in a crippled state. Amen. You don't have to stay there in a state where there's no help. Amen. But I'm glad to report to you, God, we'll hear a life alert button being hit tonight. Amen. If you'll just hit the button, honey, he'll come and he'll get you up off the floor. He'll bandage up your wounds. He'll doctor up your broken. or just hungry, but verse 46, I'm just blaming on the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Verse 46 says, And they came, they came to Jericho, talking about His disciples. And as He, talking about Jesus, went out of Jericho with His disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, sat, son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. When He heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. If you don't get nothing else tonight, get those two verses. When this man cried mercy, the next verse says this. And the Bible said that they tried to shut him up, but he kept on crying. But then the Bible says in verse 49, and Jesus stood still. Yeah. I'm talking about the prime mover of the universe, honey. I'm talking about the one that created the sun, created the moon and the stars. Yeah. That got this thing spinning on its axis and keeps us from colliding. Stopped at the cry of a man saying, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And the Bible says this, and they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what will that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, I love this, Go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. I want to preach for just a minute tonight on this subject. Help me, I'm falling and I can't get up. I want you to look at your neighbor and tap him on the shoulder and say, why don't you hit the button tonight? Some of y'all didn't get that. Because you think the person next to you don't need it. But 
maybe you're encouraging them to get help tonight. You ought to hit the life alert button tonight. Yeah. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. I do understand it's not by might nor by power, but by thy spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I pray that you'll anoint me from the hair of my head to the soles of my feet. I pray, God, that you bind any devil that might try to sneak in here tonight. Yeah. If the, if they um, came around, the blood to run them off. But Lord, if any I'm trying to lurk back in here, I plead the blood. Yeah. I don't plead the fifth. I plead the blood. Yeah. And the blood's got power, God, to run them off. I pray tonight you'd anoint me and let me preach as a dying man to dying men and women. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Several years ago, I was pastor in a church uh, in between evangelism and my first pastor. My first pastor, I, I got to asking God some real honest questions. I said, God, why does it seem like your people are living in fear, defeat, and dejection? I said, God, why does it seem like the devil is winning the battle and God's people are losing the battle? Yeah. And I went off to a youth camp. I was a young preacher. had some very honest questions in my heart. I was asking God. And a man by the name of Johnny McDowell got up and preached on strongholds. It was a message that I didn't realize when I heard it would change me forever. He told a, man, he told a story about a young lady that was in her 30s and she was going through counseling. She had some psychological problems in her mind. And she was in a counseling session. And in the middle of that counseling session, it was found out that she had hatred against her daddy and against her sister. They came out of the counseling session. Come to find out this is what had happened. She had a twin sister. And uh, one day the daddy took the two twin girls to go see grandmother when they were real little. When they got to grandmother's house, grandma did for them what she always does for the children. She gave them something special. And so she gave both of them a raggedy and doll. And one girl was effervescent and bubbly. One girl was an introvert. They were not exactly the same. I found out your kids are not the same. Go with me, amen. And, and the effervescent, bubbly girl, when they got ready to leave, Daddy looked over there and said, I want you to tell Grandma thank you. She went running, jumped up into Grandma's lap, pinched her on the cheek, kissed her all over the face, and said, thank you, Grandma, for my raggedy and all. Well, the other girl was there, and the daddy looked at her and said, tell your grandmother thank you. And the more daddy pressed, the more she turned in. She couldn't bring herself to do what her sister had done. She didn't have the same personality. She was not effervescent and bubbly. She was bashful and shy. And the more the daddy pressed her, the more she turned in. Finally, in a fit of anger, the daddy looked at the little girl and said, I'm going to teach you a lesson. If you won't do that like I told you, he said, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And he took that raggedy and doll and ripped it from her arms and gave it to her twin sister. Said, that'll teach you not to do what I told you to do. Had no idea that that little girl lived with an emotional scar all during her growing up years and into her 30s. And now at the age of 30, she's carrying a bitter grudge and a bitter spirit toward her daddy and her sister. You know, I got to thinking about that. That girl was living with what I call a stronghold. A stronghold defined as anything that totally consumes or dominates your liberty in Christ. Somebody here tonight, you've got something in your life that we're going to call a stronghold that has dominated or consumed your liberty in Christ. Can I stop and tell you tonight, there's still a life alert button you can hit. I don't know where you put me, but God bless you folks out there. Say amen. I just stopped for just a minute, and I want to give you a proposition. I believe that every Christian, I don't think I have one back there. Great, I'm making it up as I go. I, I believe that every Christian can find victory in the cross of Christ. And you can be set free from your stronghold tonight. God can deliver you from your stronghold tonight. God can do through you what you didn't think could be done through you. And God can set you free, honey, and do something for you that Ajax wouldn't do for you. Say amen. I want to stop for a minute and tell you, I believe there are three truths that I want to point out. Number one, I want to look at the setting of the story. The setting is this. Verse 46 says it this way. And they came to Jericho talking about the 
disciples. And as he, talking about Jesus, went out of Jericho, and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Here's the setting. If you remember the story of little Zacchaeus, the Bible said Jesus came into Jericho, and it said Zacchaeus was a wee little man. The little song you sung in nursery rhymes. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to. We believe that Jesus had come into town. Zacchaeus was the entrance of, the, of what happened in the town. Jesus is now leaving. As he's going out of town, there's a blind man sitting by the highway side. And he's begging and he's asking for alms. He's crying out, I want alms. Alms for the poor. Will you help me? He's on the highway side begging. Now, the setting of the story is that. Now, number two, I want to talk to you about the stronghold of the story. I want to talk to you about this man's stronghold. The Bible said that he was blind. The Bible says that he could not see. He was a man that did not have a vision. And he could not see. Wow. And he sat by the highway side begging. As a matter of fact, I got to thinking about that. In this man's story, his stronghold would be his blindness. And his blindness caused him to do three things. The Bible said he sat. The Bible said he sat. And then he sat by the highway side. And he sat there begging. The word sat simply means this. There was no activity in his life. Your stronghold will cause you to be still. It will cause you not to have any activity in your life. It will bring you to a dead stop. There's no longing after God. There's no longing after going to church. There's no longing about spiritual matters. I wonder how many people in the house of God today have set down on God. You used to be on fire. You used to have a testimony. You used to sing. You used to teach. You used to have something in your heart that would burn inside of you. But today, you are set down and you're no longer serving. Number two, his stronghold caused him to soak. He was in the ditch. And uh, I got to thinking about that for just a minute. He sat by the highway side. He was sitting in the filth wow. and the debris of what was around him. Uh, in the ditch down where I'm from in South Georgia, those ditches will fill up with water and rain. Sometimes a pine tree will fall in a ditch and everything in that ditch washes to that one place and stops. This man had been sitting by the highway side in that field for no telling how long. His stronghold caused him to be an inactive person. He sat, but then he soaked in the nasty around him. And number three, he soaked. He was a beggar. He didn't have anything in him that gave him any kind of esteem. He begged to live. He begged to survive. He begged to go forward. Can I ask you a question? What has your stronghold done to you? It's taking your money. It's taking your family. It's taking your future. It's taking everything that was dear to you. And you're begging. And you've resorted to a beggar. You're a pauper. And your sin has lowered you to the state of a pauper. You're now a beggar. Now I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to preach another minute. Can I do that tonight? Say amen. I believe not only this man's stronghold was his blindness, but I'm going to talk to you and I about our, our stronghold. Say, preach, I'm not blind. I got two eyes. Preach, I'm not blind. I'm perfectly fine. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says about your stronghold in mind. Galatians chapter 5, it says there's a war going on inside of you. That's right. It said the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And that word lusteth means it's in a full dead fist fight. Right. Your spiritual man is fighting with that fleshly man inside of you. Yeah. And whatever's the, the most dominant, whatever's the strongest is going to win. He said if your fleshly man is in charge, this is what you can expect. He said the works of the flesh are these, are manifest, which are these. The word manifest means made known. And he begins to catalog a list of sins that your flesh will resort you to being in a stronghold with. He says the word adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, 
sins. Then he goes on to the second group of sins. He says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. He goes on and says envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings. And then look at what the Apostle Paul said. He said in case I left something out, I'm going to give you three more words to put right there in your pipe so you know that you're guilty and such like. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, and such like. You know what that means? That means anything you didn't name that still controls you. Yeah. 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 Come on, that's right. Help put crack there. Put alcohol there. Yeah. Uh, put it, whatever you want to put there. But if it's dominating you, it's controlling you, honey. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. He said, and I tell you, which I've told you before as I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the what? Kingdom of God. He didn't say you wouldn't go to heaven. He said you wouldn't be victorious in the kingdom that God's got for you here. Say amen. amen. Yeah. I don't believe with anything in my heart tonight that God, I believe that God spoke to me clearly and told me to walk out here tonight tell my son to look like an idiot. So that I could give you this truth tonight. No, that's good. There are three strongholds. I want to break them down quickly. No. They're sexual strongholds. Yeah. Right. He said the number one, they start with adultery. Yeah. Now you may have never climbed into bed with somebody other than your spouse. But you might have climbed into bed in your heart with them. Come on, yeah. The Bible said that Jesus made this statement in the Gospel of Matthew 5. He said, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. And adultery defined by Webster Dictionary is this. Unfaithfulness to the marriage bed. He said, but you've heard it all, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh for a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. He said, you don't have to take your britches off to be guilty. He said, you don't have to have a private room and a motel to be guilty. He said, I can, I can be guilty of this just by the very fact that my heart has been lusting at the things that ought not to lust after. That's right. Right. Some of y'all are bound up in adultery. You've committed adultery and your mind is wrapped with those memories. You can't get free, so you say, I might as well keep doing it. Oh Can I tell you tonight, that's a stronghold that's got you dominated. The second one is the word fornication. And I'm going to preach this one, honey, because I'm about sick and tired of people trying to make preachers feel bad for telling the truth. Fornication is sex. Outside of marriage. Right. Any kind of sex outside the confines of a marriage vow is a sin against God. Amen. I don't care if you're trying to merchandise out. Amen, if you're brother. sin, it's going to work out. God condemned you already and said it is a sin against God. Amen. We got people today shacking up with each other and living like they want to. I pray God will root you up tonight and expose you for who you are. If you're not married, you ain't got no business having sexual relations with anybody outside the confines of marriage it is a sin against God Amen, Amen. the word fornication also has as its root word the word pornea yeah. which is where we get our word for pornography and I'm so mad I can tear this rug up tonight pornography has ruined our many a life yeah. and parents trust me when I say what I'm saying those little phones them kids are holding in their hands ain't nothing but a Playboy magazine if you ain't careful. Yeah. It's a penthouse yeah, magazine man, to them. If it's not controlled and it's not regulated, then your kids will look at it and it will control their thinking the rest of their lives. That's, right. That's true. I've, I've tried to be a good daddy and give my phone, give my kids phones. But I'm telling you, I believe that's one of the most dangerous tools that's ever been placed in the hands of a child. Yeah. 13-year-old don't have no restraint about what they're looking at. An 18-year-old, if they're not right with God, won't have no restraint. But mom and daddy, you've got permission. You pay the bill. You're the one that bought the phone to start with. Walk in there and say, I don't want no locks. I don't want no codes. And I'm going to see every history in your phone. I said, Amen. Right Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. I'm going to sign my own Bible in a minute. Amen. Yeah. He said fornication. He said uncleanness. That's foul. Morally impure. That's just filthy. Then he said the word lasciviousness. That is a 50 cents King James word. I'm going to break it down. It, 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 here's the definition. It is a wanton appetite.
that knows no shame. It means that you don't care that you dress naked and everybody sees it. You don't care that your drawers are showing and everybody sees it. You don't care about revealing your body parts to other people. It don't matter because we're in a society that's done got used to it. You can't walk through the mall without having to repent. Yep. Just the mannequins are filthy. Go in the amen right like there. Amen. Amen, brother. They ain't lusting after no mannequin. They got that high strung drawers on them with, with lace on both sides. Go in the amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Got that mannequin up there that looks like the Incredible Hulk. Yeah. You can't tell me y'all didn't walk by and fantasize say, yeah. man, I wish I looked like that. Six people laugh with me right there. Amen. The rest of you are feeling guilty right now. <laughs> but on top of that, you can't take them in public anymore in a public setting without having them being exposed to stuff they ought not to be exposed to. My goodness, lasciviousness has taken our culture into another level. It's no longer embarrassing anymore. It's acceptable. And if you don't act like them, you're just an old hermit somewhere in the old ages. That's it. It ain't, it ain't right to be modest anymore. Y'all with me say amen. Amen. I'm, yeah. preaching, I'm telling you I'm preaching right. And I can feel I can feel the brakes putting on out of here. He's going to start telling me how to dress. No, sir. I quit telling our church members how to dress because God's big enough to spank them. Y'all with me say amen. amen. I don't have to tell them how to dress because God will straighten them up. God's big enough to take care of his sheep. I don't have to straighten out God's business. He can do it. Y'all with me say amen. amen. There's a responsibility, though, in your heart to live in such a way that you don't produce lust in somebody else's heart. We want to condemn everybody for looking and lusting, but what about the person that makes them lust? You're just as guilty. Amen. And glory to God. The way you bat your eyes, the way you say things, I'm telling you, people can talk with their eyes. They can they can flirt with their eyes. People know when there's somebody flirting with them. They know when they're oh, casting yeah. their eye at them. They know when they're saying things to them in a body language. They know what's going on. We're not stupid, honey. But can I tell you, God says it is a stronghold that's going to dupe you for eternity. Right. Do you know 56 million Americans have a sexually transmitted disease and it's because they've got up the confines of marriage and they've broken the marriage cut and God ain't pleased with it. Amen. Right. I, I'm preaching right tonight. Say amen. 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 Whoa! Now, do you see? I, I see a sexual stronghold. But number two, I want to talk to you about what I call selfish strongholds. I believe the Bible teaches this selfish strongholds and it get, begins to categorize them. He says idolatry. That's the worship of idols or anything you put ahead of God. Right. What is it you put ahead of God? It don't have to be a shrine or a statue that you bow before. It can be a hunting lodge. Are y'all with me? Yeah. A bass boat. It can be a golf club. It can be your car. It can be something you put ahead of God. Yeah. There ought to be nothing between you and God. God ought to be the first one that you adore and love. And everything else is secondary and thirdary. Honey, amen and amen. He mentions the word witchcraft. That's not, listen, sorcery or enchantment. That's Ouija boards. Listen to me. We're living in a society that's opened themselves up to channeling. They've opened themselves up to demonic spirits. The things they've listened to, the things they've watched to the eye gate is controlling them. I said amen and amen. Somebody said, preach, I like the way you preach. Well, you missed the first two nights because I was preaching full of grace. And I'm doing it tonight and we'll do it in a minute. But I believe sometimes you got to expose sin for people to appreciate the grace that will cover their sins. Say amen. He says, <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm going to preach on. Amen. Hatred. Oh, yes. Can you think of somebody that you can't stand right now? Now, listen to me. I believe tonight we're living in a society where people hate people over nothing. They'll hate people right. over a Facebook post. They'll hate people over a just statement that's made and we're taken out of context. They'll hate you over something that happened in your past that you couldn't control. But, honey, the Bible says it is a stronghold and it leads to variance, which is disagreement, dissension, and discord. We don't have business meetings at our church. You know why? Because I ain't putting up with fussing and fighting and fuming over light bulbs and toilet paper. If they can't trust a, a pastor enough to buy something, then honey, you don't need him to be your pastor. Amen. If he's out of control, pray him out of the pulpit. Amen. But honey, let the pastor lead and don't nitpick him about the cover of the paint in the bathroom. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Let's God don't worry about if it's 60 watt or 40 watt. Just go ahead and enjoy whatever wattage is in the house of God. Man. 
We was preaching a revival somewhere last week. And somebody was overheard saying, well, the expenses are going to go up this week, I reckon, because we had a camper plugged up at the church. Well, my goodness, I, I hate to give you back your $5.32 because we had some power running out of your little meter box there. That's the reason why you had 12 people in a broom closet before that preacher got there, honey. I say, glory to God, most churches are locked down because they are in disagreement and they're in variance and they're in dissension. Let the man of God lead and watch God. Celebration Baptist Church is one of the greatest churches in the planet. I don't have fussing and fuming, and I pray I never do. Say amen. Thank you, brother. I signed, I let him sign a lease on a 154 acre golf course for $1,000 a month, and I ain't heard nobody complain, at least to my face. Y'all with me? Say amen. Amen. You know why? Because I ain't going to sit around the rest of my ministry and play tiddly winks. Right. I ain't going to sit around the rest of our ministry trying to figure out whether we can reach people. Hey, the resources are available. Your faith is shallow. Oh, Just step oh, on oh, out and do something for God. Say amen. What I'm preaching right there, I need $100,000. And somebody wants to donate it to help us get the camp going. Y'all want me to say amen. Yeah. God gave us the property. He gave us the modular buildings. And now I believe He's going to give us the money to do what we need to do so your young people yes. can be pulled out of hell. Yes. Your young people can hear the truth out of 12 and 13 and 14 year old state. Yes. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. I'll ask you this question tonight as you listen to me preach. Is there any selfish strongholds in the building tonight? He names the next one in simulations. That means competition or jealousy. There's so much jealousy going on today, people can't even function in the house of God. They're jealous over each other singing. They're jealous over the preaching. They're je Listen to me. I'm preaching right. Y'all with me say glory to God. Glory to God. Word wrath, that's anger. Violent rage, that's an outward explosion of that inward brewing. The word strife, it means to quarrel a war. Seditions mean civic discord. That's people that stir up strife and says, follow me and not the pastor. And can I tell you something? Anybody that usurps the authority of the man of God is out of line. Anybody that undermines the man of God is out of line. Did you hear what I said? God's big enough to take care of His preacher. He don't need somebody doing it for Him. Say amen. amen. That's good. That's true. The last one is heresies. Uh, fundamental error in doctrine. That is selfish strongholds. And he gives us one last one. And I call these social strongholds. Yeah. Listen to what they are. He names them here. He says the word envies. That means discontented or excited by another person's success. The word covetous can be put there. Yeah. There are people that are coveting other people's wives. They're coveting other people's jobs. They're coveting other people's cars. It is a sin and covetousness leads to the other downfall of the other nine commandments. Amen. I can prove that. I ain't got time to do it tonight. The word drunkenness, that's intoxication. And the word revelings, that's the feast with noisy jalility. That's a rock concert or that country concert you're going to. It ain't nothing but a big orgy is all it is. A bunch of people out there getting drunk want to have sex one with another. Hello and amen. And so here's where you are tonight. You're sitting, you're soaking, and you're soaking. You are begging, you are in the filth, and you're doing nothing. But I want to give you the solution. I wouldn't be much of a preacher if I didn't give you a way out of this ditch. Say amen. Amen. Here it is real fast. Number one, you must be willing to admit your stronghold has you. And you don't have it. That's good. I'm going to repeat this. Come on, help us. You must be willing to admit right. your stronghold has you and you don't have it. I can handle this alcohol. Uh-uh. It's got you. Right. Right. I can handle this little sex outside of marriage. It's got you. Right. I, it's going to lead to a deeper sin, a bigger sin, right. and eventually something that is a total disgrace publicly in the eyes of those you're in presence of. 
Can I tell you what the Bible says happened to this man? The Bible said he admitted. He got humble. Look at this. Give me that verse 47, Grace, if you will. The Bible said as they're leaving the city, verse number 47 at the top, maybe, honey, if you'll go back up there. They're leaving the city. And as they're going out of the city, the Bible says that this man began to cry out. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to say, Jesus! Jesus! Thou son of David! Please have mercy on me! Please, please! And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. Jesus! Please! Have mercy on me! Please! Please! The fact that he used the word mercy implies that he was guilty. And he wasn't asking for some handout because he was done wrong. He was there begging because he knew whatever he did that caused his blindness was the reason why he was there. And he was begging for mercy. And people were saying, shut up. Keep this thing Presbyterian around here. Don't get too vocal about needing God. Don't get too excited about begging for help. Oh, we don't want your kind in here. He was tired of being in the field. He was tired of sitting down. He was tired of the inactivity. And he was tired of begging for his life. I'm going to give you some verses on humility at the bottom, Grace, if you'll look at it with me. Just start at the bottom on humility. I'm going to throw them out. Boom, boom, boom. Watch this. At the very bottom of the text, baby. Just start. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Listen to this. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And before honor is what? Humility. Listen to verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the one humble. The Bible says in, in uh, Proverbs, pride go before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. He says, better is it to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than divide the spoil with the proud. He says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in an evil way and a foreign mouth do I hate. He says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Can I ask you a question tonight? Have you got humble about where you are tonight? Maybe you're inactive. Maybe you're soaking. Maybe you're soaking. It's time to just say, I need help. Amen. You can't fix it. It's already whipped your tail, honey. It's brought you to the lowest part of your life. I'm helping somebody tonight. Yes, sir. Getting a hernia in the midst of it, helping somebody. Say amen. Number two, uh, y'all better hang with me. I gotta finish this. Oh, that's good. You must be willing to acknowledge your stronghold to God. The Bible says in verse fifty-one, Jesus called for him and said, "Come." And he said this to him. He said, "What will, sir? Listen to this. What will that I should do unto thee? I may receive my sight." What is it you need? That I may receive my sight, Lord. Please. Now here's my question. If Jesus is omniscient, which means He knows everything, He knew what He needed. But why did He ask Him? Because He already knew He wanted Him to tell it. He wanted Him to get honest. And if you can't get honest with God, you'll never get help. I need my sight. Number three, you must be willing to agree with God about your stronghold. Verse 50 says, And he, casting away his garment, get a picture of this, rose and came to Jesus. <laughs> Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> he go pick that go pick that blanket up. You stay right there. You stay right there. Go pick the blanket up. He casting away his garment. Pick it up. This thing had been wrapped around him. It was full of nasty. Stay right there. It was full of nasty. But here's what he did. He threw the nasty off. And he came to Jesus. 
It is a beautiful picture of this. If we confess our sins, yes. He is faithful and just right. to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Oh, yes. Yes. You must be willing to agree with God. About, that's what confession means, to agree with God or say the same thing that God said about a matter. <laughs> then number four, you must be willing to accept and give forgiveness. I never heard this man one time blame anybody. That's good. He didn't say my mama made me live this way. Right. He didn't say it was my papa's fault or my daddy's fault or my brother. Yeah. Never once heard him blame anybody. And I heard Jesus say to him, Go thy way. Thy faith right. has made me whole. He got forgiveness and he gave forgiveness because he never brought up the people that wronged him. Amen. Then lastly, get up Josiah. Stay behind me for a minute. Just stay with me. You must be willing to admit daily your need for Him. It's called renunciation. The last verse, verse number 52. Jesus said, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately He received His sight and followed Jesus. In the way. Yes. Wherever Jesus went, yes. that's where he went. Amen. If he said Jesus went this way, he wasn't somewhere in the shadows of where Jesus was. The only way you're going to get rid of your stronghold is stay with Jesus. Yes. Follow him. Yes. But he didn't just say follow him. He said follow him in the way. Right. you got to follow him the Bible way. Yes. You can't follow him your way. You can't follow Him going to church at Easter and Christmas. You've got to find a place of worship and follow God. Find the cross and stay in it. Wherever He's at, that's where you are. He ought to turn around and you be right there with Him. Wherever He's at, there you are. You ain't leaving Him. And you know what you'll have to do? You'll have to get up every day and say, this is a struggle, God, but by Your grace, I'm going to get rid of it. But I'm staying in Your shadow. And if I stay in Your shadow, I know I'll find help because with You, there's strength. With You, there's forgiveness. I'm getting rid of the filth. I'm getting rid of the nasty. I'm walking with God. I'm forgiving everything and everybody and I'm accepting the forgiveness of heaven. Put your hands together and give God some glory. You to sit right there for a minute, blind Bartimaeus. I'm going to ask this question tonight. How many of you would admit that you've got a stronghold? You don't have to tell me. But in your heart right now, there's something that's dominating and controlling your liberty in Christ. I'm going to get Misty. She will go to the piano. I'm going to share this story in closing. Just get ready, sister. Don't start just for a moment. Just, just get your place there if you will. Some years ago, I was a pastor in South Georgia. And uh, back then, I didn't have a whole bunch of people on staff to help me with different projects. It was just pretty much me. I was the air conditioning, turn her on and off her, lock the doors her, youth pastor, janitor. Y'all, anybody here with me the same way? Yeah. And uh, we had a youth group that we used to do what we call youth ministry to widows. I took them out one Saturday. We went to this lady's house named Airly Cruz. She's died and gone home to be with the Lord now. Her yard had not been manicured or cut for years. She had what they call those big magnolia trees. Them big bay leaves on them. Them big pine cone looking things. Those uh, trees, that tree had grown so much that literally it had grown to the dirt, sprouted new trees and grow trees around it. Yeah. Her azalea bushes were as high as her house. You couldn't even walk on one side of her house for the patch of briars and bushes that had grown. We got up there one day and we worked and worked and cut and cut and worked piled up a huge place where there, I mean, debris was extremely large. 
and a little field behind her house. I asked the people that owned the field, can I burn the debris? They said, sure. So I told the youth, I said, y'all did such a good job today. I'm going to let y'all go home, refresh a little bit. We're going to pick you back up, bring you back later this evening. And we're going to have a bonfire. And we're going to roast hot dogs and marshmallows. So we started that bonfire. The only thing I learned about that bonfire is you can't roast a marshmallow on a bonfire. That sucker burn you up. Well, we still had fun anyway. I bet mean, you could stand away from the fire and the, and the thing would still cook. Amen. Well, we had a good time. Things were dying off. We were trying to send the youth home. I had three or four kids I had to take home in the church van. One of them lived 13 miles in the Georgia Bend. Another one lived down past the house where the pastorium was. So I decided that we put the fire out. So me and those boys got a water hose and we put that bot. It was burnt down so we went in and put it out. We got it all blackened and put out. We loaded up one and I went out to the Georgia Bend to drop him off. 13 miles back in the town, I got to thinking, you know, it'd really be rough for us to burn that lady's house down. And I'm going to be going to make sure that fire's out. It was out when I left the first time. But when I pulled up, that thing was blazing again. And I got to thinking to myself, oh, you know, I thought I'd put that thing out. To the eye, it was out. What I could see, it was out. But I went ahead and put it out again. And I said, Zay, get that stick, son, and put it in that little, that black mess down there that looks like ain't nothing burning. He stuck that stick down in there and flipped it, and I saw the culprit. There were still hot coals burning underneath that black ash. And that was the reason why the fire fueled back up. It's because he, we had not got down to the root right. of the fire. Yeah. And if you just superficially cover what you've been struggling with, it'll be blazing again tomorrow. Yeah, right. What you need to do is come to this black ash right. and put yours on the altar. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Now look at me so spiritual. No, go ahead. Yeah. You ought to put yours on the altar. Yeah. And then stick that stick down in where it hurts and pull back the nasty and say, Here's my problem. Would you extinguish the reason for the flame? Yeah. I don't want to live with it anymore. Amen. If you're willing to do that tonight, I promise you some of y'all are going to leave different. My but some of y'all are still going to be living in adultery tomorrow. Because you think you got it put out. But it's still raging in your heart. You better get down here and put a stick in it, honey. You better put the cross in it. And reveal the nasty and the fuel. And fuel in that thing. And put it out tonight. Amen and amen. amen. Now listen. Hallelujah. I've, pre I've literally preached my guts out tonight. I'm about to wear a waste away belt tomorrow night to keep it in. I want to ask this question tonight. Maybe you're here and you say, Preacher, I ain't got no strongholds. Pray for the rest of us because we're struggling. But I think if everybody in here got honest tonight, she's playing right now. If everybody got honest, there's something you're struggling with. Maybe I named it. Maybe I didn't. But it has kicked your tail. And it's time for you to kick it in the tail tonight. Say, by the grace of God, I'm not going to live with that stronghold anymore. How many of you get up and come join me on this altar? Amen, and if it ain't a stronghold that you got, thank Him for getting you through the one you had. By the grace of God, all over this tent. Come on, right now. Right now, they're coming. Sing, sister, if you will.
couple more minutes. If you ain't got things settled, come to this altar. Ask somebody to pray with you. Let me ask every head bowed, every eye closed. Every in this building know without a shadow of a doubt. You know that you're saved by the grace of God. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Hold your hand up. Now there's a couple of hands that's not raised, and everybody just remain praying. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, look.
Are all hearts and minds clear? Can we walk out of this tent tonight? God and everything said. That magnet leader ain't going to go off.